These electric casting furnaces are great, but they have a serious problem and a few other drawbacks. I've been casting with these things for years, and I love how easy they are to use. Especially how they don't belch 100 decibel fire everywhere, like my propane foundry furnace. I'm going to show you how to use these electric ones, I'll show you some of the quirks, and we'll talk about some of those drawbacks in a minute. We're going to see if this new version that just came out fixes some of those problems. And then as a bonus, I'm going to show you how not to cast something. First off, what are these things anyway? These are small electric metal melting furnaces for casting. They're usually used by like jewelers or anyone melting a very small amount of metal at a very specific temperature. They're usually used for investment casting, though I use them for sand casting also. They come in several different kinds of kits. This one comes from Vivor. It comes with a pair of leather gloves, a very cool ingot mold, which we will talk about later, a big crucible, some crucible tongs, which always seem a little bit undersized to me, a little flimsy, but they work. Some instructions, a power cord, and the furnace itself. You plug this thing into a normal 120 volt house socket. You don't need a big fancy breaker. I got a 15 amp circuit out here in the garage. It works perfectly fine. You put the metal you want to melt into the crucible. You stick it in there. You click the U. You adjust your temperature on the arrows. You click P. It turns on and away it goes. Very simple. It'll slowly heat up to the temperature you set and then just hold it there until you turn it off. The temperature is displayed in Celsius. I shoot for like 40 or so Celsius above the melting point of the metal uh, as a starting point and then adjust from there. It's very easy. Now I've been using these for years and I got a couple of tips. First off, when the temperature, the actual temperature reading, which is the top of the two numbers, says you've reached temperature, the thermocouple is up to temperature, but that's because it's butted right up against the heating elements. The metal inside the crucible inside that chamber lags behind a bit. The more metal you have in there, the more it'll lag behind. I generally wait until it looks all liquid, and then I give it another 15 minutes or so. Next tip, I got a lot of people running these on my online metal casting course, and a couple of them seem to have calibration issues. More than one person has had theirs, say, 1150 Celsius, that's very, very hot, and a little bit of bronze in the crucible, never melted. It sat there for like an hour or two. I've had a couple that said 1050 Celsius, and the bronze inside was all super liquid. That's below the liquidus point of ancient bronze. It shouldn't be like that. Clearly there's some discrepancy there, and the end user, me or them, we can't adjust it. I think when that happens, you just have to exchange it for another one. Or stick with lower temperature metals, which is probably a good idea. Last tip, when they're working fine, these things can definitely melt silver, gold, copper alloys like bronze. No problem. But heating elements are expendable, especially at those temperatures. The more you run them up to maximum temperature like that or close, the quicker they burn out, or more accurately, the faster they lose maximum temperature. Potters will tell you all about this. They have kilns in the, with, with elements in them. They don't replace elements when they burn out. They replace elements when they can no longer get hot enough. Supposedly, you can replace heating elements in these. I've had trouble finding replacements. I just get a new kit with new crucibles because the crucibles are also kind of expendable. You can see how worn away these things look, and I wasn't exactly rolling them around for fun. Eventually, they start to get thin. The, the heat kind of burns them out, and I wouldn't want one to break while I'm holding onto it full of bronze. I actually had one break inside a furnace once. Turns out I overstuffed it. Don't fill the things up to the brim and then fire the thing up. I would say like half full. And then if you want more metal, wait till it's like hot and melting and then add a little bit at a time. There's a bonus tip for you. Oh, and don't just jam stuff in there or throw it in the bottom. You can break the bottoms out too. Here is where this newer one might be better. This is a ceramic crucible. No longer the black graphite ones like this, which are different in color, and get your hands filthy every time you touch one. They say in the marketing that the ceramic ones last longer. Honestly, I haven't had it long enough to tell. The graphite ones were great because the metal would always pour out very cleanly. You would never have residue left inside there. And supposedly the graphite itself can help prevent oxide defects in the metal for some metals. This is probably more important for like silver and other metals like that. That's nice and all, but if you look up the price of the graphite crucibles, they are not cheap. And I believe that's probably why they switched to the ceramic ones. I'm not sure if the ceramic ones will stay as nice inside uh, at copper melting temperature, but for ZA12, they seem to be just fine. I was able to pull the extra unmelted metal out in a single piece nice and clean. The crucible looks no worse for wear. The ceramic crucibles I use in the propane furnaces get pretty messed up looking when it comes to copper temperatures, but they seem to work fine. You just can't clean out the inside very nice, uh, but you really should have a different crucible for different metals anyway to prevent contamination. Unfortunately, this only comes with one in the kit. Speaking of the crucibles, 
by far the biggest problem with all of these electric furnaces is how big they aren't. They are not big, they're very small. Most of these come with a one and a three kilogram crucible. Some of them are two. Don't get too hung up on the kilogram measurement. For most people, if you're doing investment casting, especially like the vacuum plaster investment casting, the one to three kilogram crucibles are more than big enough. Tons of sand casting can even be done with the three kilogram crucible. And for reference, the three kilogram crucible is about two and a half pounds of ZA-12, my favorite casting metal. That's two and a half of these bricks. It also holds enough bronze to make this sign here, which is how I made this. Lots of home metal casting just doesn't need that much metal, but sometimes you kind of do. I get it. Sometimes it would be nice to have the temperature control of this thing with, with some more, more volume. How about nearly double the volume? This is not a one or a three kilogram crucible. This is a five kilogram crucible. By the way, this is the only size crucible that fits in this furnace. I tried fitting the three in there, it doesn't fit. Too small. The hole's too big, it would just fall right in. And for the mass thing, for the kilo thing, I've heard conflicting arguments there, depending on what you're measuring, but digging around on Rio Grande's website and doing some math, it seems like the closest there is measurements in 18 karat gold which is obviously denser than copper. Who, I ask, has 18 karat gold laying around by the kilogram? Who? I want to know. Can I have some? I want to melt it. Anyways, by volume, this should hold about four pounds of ZA-12, which is roughly this much. But don't do that. You know, don't fill these crucibles right up to the brim. That's kind of a safety hazard. They're very difficult to pour when you do that. Trust me, I tried. That means this crucible is big enough for these small ingots that I make using this little ingot tray. It's also more than big enough for these one pound roto metals ingots. You can actually stick them in there back to back and it's even big enough for the giant four pound ones. But don't do that, obviously. Like, it, it sticks at the top, it's just too big. I might try it though. Leave a comment if you think I should try it. Who am I kidding? I'm definitely gonna try it. Not today though. Then there's this ingot mold. This does not come with the smaller furnace and it definitely should. It makes ingots about this size. I only filled it about halfway because I wanted thin ones. These are perfect for fitting in this, but they're also small enough to fit perfectly into the three kilogram ones with like room to spare. Please include that with the other kits. I made a whole stack of the bricks and you can see their size relative to the one pound Roto Metals one. It's probably, these are probably like half a pound a piece. This is awesome. I like this. I melted down a bunch of scrap ZA-12 to make a pile of these. I also made a bunch of these, uh, which I made out of these, these graphite ingot molds that I got out of Amazon. You should definitely get one of these too. Okay, enough about the furnace. Let's see it in action. I'm gonna cast one of these. This is a sand rammer, a split pattern, 3D printed sand rammer. I already have one of them right here but I don't have a bad one of them. I need a bad example to show in my metal casting course and now's as good a time to make one as any. The problem is gonna be shrinkage. When you have a large thick section like this on the end here, that part's gonna solidify last and it's gonna shrink the most. There are ways to prevent and fix that, which is why the one I'm using doesn't have that problem. But today I'm doing everything I can to maximize shrinkage. There are a bunch of ways to avoid shrinkage in metal casting. Uh, the obvious one is using something called a feeder. I didn't actually use a feeder for the one I'm using to ram up the problem uh, because feeders use a lot of metal and yet the casting is fine. There is truly more than one way to skin a cat without shrinkage defects, as they say. After a quick angle grindering, you can see the terrible shrinkage on the square end and even a little bit on the pointy end. Honestly, I rushed this whole casting process, but the surface finish isn't too bad either. You can see the layer lines from the printed pattern, even where the nozzle tracked back and forth on the top, but that shrinkage is hideous. So will this work as a sand rammer? Absolutely yes, it'll probably work just fine. Um, but I'm not, I'm not content with work just fine. I want it to look really good straight out of the sand, and this does not. Shrinkage is a no-no. It doesn't just make it look deflated and sad, but it can cause other problems like voids, other structural defects. I don't want none of that. But it's a great learning tool, and also probably a great sand ramming tool uh, in the inevitable event where I lose the other one. That only happens uh, every two weeks. Enough of that, back to the furnace. I think this big furnace is an excellent way to get into metal casting, especially if you're using ZA-12, or, or if you, even if you can get aluminum chunks that are small enough to fit. Low melting metals will not wear out the crucibles or the elements nearly that quickly, and it won't have any trouble getting to those temperatures. And you have a lot more capacity than the other small ones, and you don't need a whole garage with outdoor ventilation like a propane furnace. I'm doing all of this that you're seeing here on a two foot by four foot workbench. 
single quarter sheet of plywood. That's it. This is probably going to be my go-to ZA12 casting furnace moving forward, unless I need like a lot of it, like for future lathe parts. Then, you know, you kind of need the giant propane one. So should you get one? If you're vacuum casting, probably not. Get the smaller one. You don't need the gigantic thing. If you're doing ceramic shell investment casting, like larger stuff, or even some sand casting, then this might be a good idea. Although, to be honest, the sand rammer could have been done uh, with a three kilogram crucible. It would have fit. It would have pushed it, but it would have been fine. If you want to do like huge things, like that two foot long lathe bed I did, um, you're probably just going to need to get a propane one. But that's a whole different video. I'll put links to this furnace below. You can probably find the smaller ones on that same website. And if you want to know what else you need to get to get into sand casting um, and how to avoid issues like that nasty old shrinkage there, there's a sign up down below. I will email you a free guide. See you next time.